Fish Lake Bible Church, if you would stand and join us in singing this month's Song of the Month, Belong to You. You got me swaying again on that one. I don't think that was the first time I started swaying and I did one of these numbers and I opened my eyes and I'm facing this direction. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Ah, uh, Grace and peace to you in the name of our Father, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us open this worship service, continuing on in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I am thankful for your grace, your mercy, your love. I am thankful for all the things that are true, that are good, that are pure that are excellent, that are worthy of praise. I am thankful that when actions speak louder than words, we can look to your son on the cross. We can look to your son in the grave. We can look to your son risen again for eternity. Our life is in him. If actions speak louder than words, help our minds focus on that the tomb is empty, the son is risen. We have a life in Jesus Christ. That is our sole focus this morning, is to bring about his name, his praise, his glory. Help us walk as he has walked. Help us pray as he has prayed. Help us live lives for Christ because of Christ. 
Help us love above all things one another as you have loved us through your son and his sacrifice. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn and greet each other this morning. Please and thank you. As you make your way back to your seats, I'd ask that you remain standing and join us in singing How Great Is Our God. Be seated and join us in singing as the deer.
or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. You alone may my spirit. come forward for the offering, I have a thank you card here that I'd like to read as it is addressed to all of you. Thank you all for the cards and prayers during my recent illness. It is my hope that all who gave will forget and that all of us who receive will remember the loving kindness displayed by our church family. Sinner saved by grace, Todd Yocolet. Thank you for all the prayers regarding all of the um, health issues that we have seen recently in our local body. Continue to pray for the health of all those who are under the weather, um, recovering from surgery, and even if they were all healthy and fully recovered, please remember to continue to pray for one another. Um, we have one announcement that Pack the Park is this afternoon, 1 to 3 p.m., out at Thurston Woods Park. That is the only announcements we have. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as you have blessed us so richly in all these things that we can see right now, this building, one another, everything down to even running water and electricity, help us steward all that we have here and help us be reminded that all of these things around us will fade away one day as your Son comes to make all things new Help us understand that the riches we have in your Son surpass everything we can see here on earth. And in the meanwhile, as you continue to lavish upon us blessings by your grace, help us steward all of those things in order to fulfill your command to go out and to reach the nations with your word, with the gospel, and with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Like a bloodstained cross on Calvary did. I was chained down, weighing down in my den, but I found the key in nail scarred hands. I found grace and I found love. I found hope on a wooden cross, and by your pain. I found 
would stand and join us in singing, Build My Life.
be seated. I've mentioned this before, that it is wonderful just to sometimes listen to y'all sing praises and hymns, because part of being a blessing of being a pastor is that I know a lot of your stories, and I know a lot of what you guys have been through, gone through, walked through, survived. And so to hear your voice, I can pick out some of you shouting praises to the Lord, it is good just to just to be part of his story in your life and just to be able to sing those words along with you even though my mouth is not open this morning we are going to be in luke chapter 11 27 and 28 talk about true blessedness we're going to talk about obedience and we will touch upon obedience as action but also, I want to lean heavily into obedience in our thought life. For uh, many of you know, this last week has been very daunting for my own personal thought life. Um, so this, this, it's pretty raw, it's pretty honest. I have been struggling all week on to focus my thoughts on what is true, what is good, what is pure. In order to prepare a sermon regarding what true blessedness is. Literally having to force myself to get into the Word, to force myself to pray, to force myself to not rely on how Tim can fix things, to not theorize and think about all the possible scenarios that could happen that are completely outside of my control, to be anxious for nothing and what that really means. This sermon, I know you're all here with me today. This sermon, this sermon's for Tim. This sermon is for me to hear. Um, I hope you get a blessing out of it, just like I did in preparing it. And it all comes down to the simplicity, the simplicity of obedience for the one obeying. Case in point, front porch for today. A lot of you know that I was raised by my grandparents. My grandfather is a simple man in that there are things that I can do simply to please him. There was one account in which I knew, as an 11th grader, I knew that it was my night to cut the wood and to bring the wood and stack it up near the house so that in the middle of the night when our wood fireplace was low, it'd be right there, easily inaccessible. I also know, knew that my buddy George wanted to come over and hang out and spend the night because it was the weekend. I knew what I should have done, and yet I justified with every thought of mine the very thing that I wanted, I wanted to do. So, without telling my grandfather, I went to my grandma, and I said, Gigi, can I stay over at George's tonight? She's like, well, I don't care. Ooh, I'm good. Whoop, there we go. I'm out. Grandma says it's okay. That means it's okay. So I went. About 3 o'clock in the morning at George's house was about 20 minutes away from my home, in which I was raised. Um, you see, George came and picked me up because he had his license at the time, and I did not. Um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard this. And my eyes opened, and I knew. I knew that knock. I knew. I was like, George, I'm in trouble. George. His dad gets up. His name is George as well. We just call, we just, we just call him Frank and George because he's a really big guy. So Frank and George gets up, and he goes and opens the door, and he just says, Tim! And I just, oh, I'm in trouble. I am in trouble. I go. My grandpa's standing there, and he's like, George, I got to go. Didn't say nothing. Get in the vehicle. He takes me home. I go right up. He walks right up to the front door, walks inside, and I know exactly I know exactly why he picked me up. He gave me a command. I knew the command. I had a choice whether to obey it or not. I thought I could get away with it. <laughs> Couldn't. Even after all of that, chop the wood, stack the wood, I get inside. I am exhausted. In the morning, waking up, he comes and talks to me, and he says, good job stacking the wood. 
and I felt good. I f- Man, wait a minute. Why? I thought he, we were going to wake up in the morning and he was just going to tear me a new one and, and just come down on me and be like, did you learn your lesson? You're not going to do that again, are you? He said, good job. What? And it made me feel good. Like my grandpa's not there to just condemn me. He is happy to see that a command had been filled. And then I just simply do did what I what I was supposed to do in the first place. But how often, church, do we stay away from the very thing we ought to do only to be humbled and be brought back to what we should have done in the first place? Oh, it's been one of those weeks. It's been one of those kinds of weeks. But God is good in that he has given us everything we need to understand how to obey him and what we're called to do. Actions speak louder than words. However, I always was interested in that phrase, the action and words. What about thoughts? What about thoughts? Because I lived a life steeped in sin, in my wretchedness, that I could and actions speak louder than words, I could use words to make people believe that I was a Christian. I could say the right thing. I could talk the right way. I could point to different things. I could say amen in the crowd. Even with my actions, I could fool people and deceive. I could dress like a Christian. I can do things that I'm supposed to do like a Christian. However, thoughts. My thoughts, I could not hide from God. I could not fool God with the intentions of my heart. He knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. Actions speak louder than words. Sure, that's a good good line. We're not to be hearers of the word, but doers also. But my question this morning is that, are you one of those that does all the actions but never really understands the intention behind it. You're just doing just to do. You're just saying just to say. From out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are you dwelling on? What are you thinking about? What are your intentions and motivations for the doing? Because our doing as Christians should be rooted in what he has already done. Our actions are to be righteous works out of gratitude for being saved and having a new life in Christ, not our actions will make us somehow worthy of this death and sacrifice. It is through his actions. It's through his words. It's through his intentions that we are to dwell on, that we are to understand. So as we enter the text, there's going to be a lot of pictures um, in this PowerPoint because we have two verses and we have coinciding references. As we make our way through these scriptures, obedience, thought life, and what we ought to be thinking about. And how does one change their thoughts? So in Luke 11, we have just wrapped up discussing the Uh, returning of an unclean spirit, that if something is removed from somebody, it needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We just got done with the uh, demon possession and a exorcism from Christ, and then they claimed that he was the devil, that he was doing it with the devil's power. All of these things just transpired, and out of the crowd, as he was saying these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast in which you nursed. This, culturally, was out of the norm. Culturally, for a woman to speak up, because as he said these things, she interrupts and just cries out and prays. Jesus Christ is a rabbi, a Jewish teacher. He was teaching in a crowd of people. Women in this culture were not supposed to raise their voices above, especially to interrupt a rabbi. But she did because she was excited. She says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast in which you nurse. She is praising Jesus' mom 
And that is not a negative thing. That is not the um, veneration of Mary. That is not the Roman Catholic praising and worshiping of Mary. In this culture, a son's standing reflects greatly on the mother. We see this in Proverbs 15, 20, which says, A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. And this word despise does not mean he hates his mother. Despise is more of brings grief to his mother. A foolish son brings or despises his mother. His actions are a reflection on the mother's character and her social standing. So if the boy is acting a fool, it's going to reflect poorly on the mother. Proverbs 17, 25 says this, A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. Christ, what he's been doing, who he is. Mary is blessed. And if it were any other woman, we'd be saying that name is blessed. For the womb that bore you, that bring about the Messiah? What standing would Mary have in reflection to what her son is doing? Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast in which you nursed. Praise her. Praise you. It's a reflection on both of them. But, and this but is not a negative. This but is not Jesus saying, no, you need to not do that. But he said, blessed rather, okay, that is a good thing. Yes, Mary's blessed. But also a good thing. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. What is praise without action? What is me telling my wife that I love her? and yet ignoring her throughout the week, ignoring her, not listening to her, not caring for her, not spending time with her, not would I be displaying what I actually meant about loving her? Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And we, t- we try to uh, form our minds in what the application is here, and the application is not for God's benefit. It does not benefit God that you hear his word and keep it. Blessed are you who hear the word and observe it, keep it, obey it. It's the simple blessing of, hey, good job with the wood. I did a good, I did a good thing. It brings a blessing to the hearer. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and philoso, keep it, observe it. Take care not to violate it. And it's easy to. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have stumbled. All have fallen. Your salvation is not in the works that you do. As a Christian, it is rooted in what he's already done. You are blessed simply in knowing that you have a Savior and your eternity is secure. But far often than not, we like to talk about what we do, what we do, what we do, as that defines who we are. We're not defined on what we do. We're defined by who He is as Christians. A lot of emphasis in obeying is what you physically do. It is easy to do something even if you don't want to. You ever ask a kid to clean their room and they go and clean it? But sometimes you hear some mumbling. Sometimes you're just like, well, I don't know why I'm going to clean my room. Dad never cleans his room. I don't understand why I'm going to do all this. Are they doing what they're supposed to? Yes. Where's their heart? What's the intention? What's going on up here? You cannot hide that from God. What is your intention for doing what you're doing? In this picture, uh, this kind of, you know, when I first started looking at when I first saw, all I saw was a giant pile of rocks and stumbling and climbing, and it was like, oh my goodness. But then you realize there's a staircase. If you were to focus and you were to look at this, and you realize that there are steps already made before you, 
And yet, whenever we have something daunting and a trial and something huge in our life, all we can see is a giant pile of rocks. We don't realize that some of those rocks are steps, steps to look up and forward. And I didn't even realize that there was these green, lush, wonderful trees in the picture. I was just focused on all the rubble, keeping our eyes fixated on what we should be fixated on, things that are good, things that are pure, things that are righteous, Far too often, all the enemy has to do is get us to focus on the pains in our lives, and then he brings about an utter, an utter absence of rest. I believe wholeheartedly stress, anxiety, is a tool of the devil to cause us to focus on ourselves more than focus on what we ought to. Is it easy to be stressed? Very easy to be stressed. I believe that we are stressed by three things. One, complete lack of control over outside circumstances. I'm a fixer. Anybody here a fixer? I'm a fixer. Complete lack of control is one thing. The next thing for the fixer is knowing exactly what's happening, but being utterly helpless to do anything about it. Or three... knowing what's going on, being unable to fix it, and trusting in yourself to be able to find the answer for it. Because when you fail yourself, when you fail your own thoughts, when your own understanding fails you, it just brings about a massive amount of stress, and you can't rest. We focus, the enemy comes to steal your joy, because he's a thief. He's a thief that comes to steal your joy because he knows that he cannot take your salvation. You know that your salvation is rooted in Jesus Christ. He has you. I mentioned it before, like that little boy in a parking lot holding on to their dad's hand thinking, I'm holding on to my dad's hand. The dad's like, <laughs> okay. The dad's holding on to him. The thief will come and attack your joy. It will, he will attack your rest. He will attack your peace because he knows he cannot touch your salvation. But it doesn't take that much for us to get focused on the pain, on the trial, on the unknown, on the anxiety. And all the while, it's right there in the scriptures. Be still and know that I am God. It was mentioned this morning in Sunday school opening. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Well, this day has been really hard. This is the day that the Lord has made and prepared for you to walk through. Knowing in his sovereignty, he has put this path before you. Rejoice and be glad in it. Whew. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It is not simple to do because we get caught up in this. It doesn't sound like this is a day I should rejoice in. A lot of difficult things have happened today. Do not lean on your own understanding. His thoughts are above your thoughts. His ways are above your ways. It's not. It is not easy. There have been times where I have, in my testimony, been driving down the road, and all of a sudden, some thought from the past creeps in, and I can li you can literally feel the anxiety build in you as you're driving down the road, and you got some music on, and all of a sudden, you catch yourself. Wait, why am I even thinking about that? Ooh, I praise the Holy Spirit for that because old Tim would just dive into those thoughts. The Holy Spirit says, hey, remember I was sleeping at George's house and I was just nice and just all, I was always resting and all of a sudden I hear, you need to wake up. I told you there's something for you to do. What is that thing that we are told to do, commanded to do? Because it's for the benefit of us, not Christ. The benefit for us. Think about 
what is true and good and profitable and excellent. Renew your mind daily with the knowledge of God. Think about these things. Think on what you have on Christ. Trust and know that he has his best intention and his best way forward for you. Sometimes those stairs in your day-to-day can be daunting. You can have thousands of steps. You try to jump all of those at once, anxiety and stress, because you're just going to keep on tumbling back down. Nobody can make that leap. One step at a time. How do kids learn how to walk? You hold them up in the air and you say, okay, you're going to move your legs super fast. I'm going to drop you and you're going to take off. No, you got to crawl first. Then you start standing on your own two feet and they do that adorable thing. And I've heard sometimes moms push the kids down if the dad's not there because they got to wait for their first steps before dad gets home. Little by little, just take the next step. Take the next step. Take the next action that would glorify God. Take the next thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. We're going to get into one of my favorite topics, history, history. In grade school, I was, my kids are in here. Um, I didn't have the greatest GPA, you know, A's are good, but <laughs> I did not, I was not a student except for one class. Anybody guess the class? Who said gym? Did somebody say lunch? It's lunch, straight A's. Uh, it was history. It was history. I, love, I loved history. I liked years. I liked dates. I liked, I, liked, I liked knowing about what was before us. All the other grades, ugh, C's get degrees and below. Why? Because I, I, I know what I liked. I know what I loved. I know what I wanted to learn about. And so there I thrived. And the things I didn't care about, I didn't care about. You will display what you care about. You will display what you love. You will think about what you want to think about. And what does the flesh want? Sin. That moment you start to dive into a thought process that is not good, not pure. Ask the Lord in prayer. Help those thoughts move far from me and make them obedient to Christ. There's times I can spiral down into uh, um, what I used to be, what I used to be, what I used to be, what I used to be. Oh, not anymore. I got a new name. He knows, he knows my new name. I hope it, I don't really like my name. My name's Tim. Like, I know it's like biblical and stuff, but it's like bland. It's kind of like unseasoned chicken. It's just Tim. I got a new name I know nothing about. He knows my new name because I have salvation in him. Don't get caught in those thought processes. Let me ask you a question. If any of you came up to one of my children and started bashing them and slandering them, who are you going to have to deal with? Dad. You are a child of God in Christ Jesus. You start bad-mouthing one of his kids, even if it's you. You're going to have to take that up with God. You're a child of God. Not what the world defines you. Not what you do defines you. He has defined you. Saved. Redeemed. Beloved. Blessed rather are you to hear the word and keep it. The blessing is for us. That's what brings about peace. Better is action than than praise. For one of the songs we just sung, which I believe wholeheartedly, he is worthy of our praise. Church, he's worthy of your action. He is worthy of your thoughts. Dwell on him richly. We're going to be in uh, Philippians 4.8, and then we're going to talk about Nero. I was blessed to be able to be part of the Digging Deeper team camp at Roush World this, this last week. And... Um, as I find my notes here, and we talked about ah, we talked about this. We were talking about um, context, and we were talking about Paul as he's writing the letter to the Philippians. In this time, Paul writing the epistle, the letter to the Philippians, was under the realm, under the emperorship of Emperor Nero, who was absolutely insane, pagan. 
known as the lowercase a antichrist, murdered his mother, murdered his wife, castrated a slave boy and turned him into his new wife, burnt the city of Rome to the ground because he wanted to rebuild. And when that backfired on him and everybody wanted to kill him for it, he needed, uh, he needed a patsy. So he points to the Christians. It's the Christians' fault. The Christians did it. Yeah. And in order to prove that it was the Christians who did it, he needed to punish the Christians. So he would put up Roman candles. Roman candles for his courtyard would be Christians that they would capture and they would pike them through the bottom of their body up, cover them in animal fat and hair, and light them on fire to light his courtyard at night. Paul, being imprisoned at this time, in a prison that looks like this, where you'd have the two guards that would be up above and underneath, literally, this isn't three hots in a cot, this is you are in a pit, they did not expect you to get out of there. That was your grave, only for the tiny circle which they would bring down some food, some water, and for Paul, they would bring down papyrus and writing utensils in order for him to continue to write. This is the context in which Paul writes these words. Philippians 4, 8 through 13. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What? What? How can he write such a thing? He is writing to the people that in the evening as they walk in by, you see that light glow and hum over by Nero's, Nero's building, Nero's temple, Nero, whatever you want to call it. That light is from your brothers and sisters being burnt alive in the pikes. But think about what is good. Because Paul knows how powerful the human mind is, and that's exactly what the enemy is going to use to bring them low. There have been testimonies of those before entering being burned alive that said, this fire will be out within the hour, and then I will be with eternity with my Savior forever. The thought process that somebody has to be in in order to be in a pit, in a Roman prison, to then tell the people on the outside, think about what's good. Think about what's pure. Pay no attention to that glow over there. That's not your eternity. Your eternity is Christ. Verse 9, <laughs> what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We fight against peace when we fight against the thoughts of our minds, when we think about the things that will make us anxious. Do you know right now, church, the things that do make you anxious and stress you out? Do you think about those things? I do. I know the very things that stress me out, and I choose to think about them. Why? Why? Because this is an imperfect mind with imperfect thoughts in a sin-fallen world. I have to, as verse 9 says, Learned, received, heard, seen in me, or seen in Paul, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things. Paul's sitting in a hole, a Roman prison, and he's writing encouraging other people. He's not focused on himself right now. Oh, okay, that's a clue. Don't focus on myself right now. Focus on the needs that surround me. Sometimes we got to get out of context in our own thoughts in order to care for somebody else, and that, that's a blessing all in itself. He goes on in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. It's good to hear that you guys care about me as well. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. For I have learned... Not born with that knowledge. Through his life, he has learned. In whatever situation, I am to be content. I am to be at rest. I am to be still. 
I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He is writing this from a Roman prison. He is writing this to people who are on their way to and fro in the marketplace, can see and hear their brothers and sisters on pikes. How can Paul do this? Paul is not better than anybody else. Paul has everything he needs. He has Christ Jesus as his Savior. He has the Holy Spirit. He has learned these things. He is choosing to dwell on what is good. How quick would it be easy for him to spiral being in a Roman prison? Quick. But he chooses to focus on what is good. One of those things that is good, and it's good for us to dwell on. This is actually a picture of where Peter was held. But as you can see, still, prison-wise, prison they did not expect these guys to get out of there. <clears throat> what is good, what is peaceful, what is loving, what is true. If you can think of any good word, focus on that. Otherwise, your thoughts will consume you. This is how I felt all week. Scatterbrained all over the place. This situation happened over here. I got no control. This situation, I know that's happening. I can't fix it. Rattled, frazzled, unknowns. It's another stressor. It's a stressor of the unknown. That can consume you. I think we've all been there not knowing what to do next, not knowing the outcome of things, not knowing that that is the enemy making us focus singularly on the tiniest thing, our life right now. It's easy to get sucked into ourself because we have this thing that we trouble with ourselves called pride. Did you know that even depression is a form of pride? Because when you're depressed, I'm sad, I'm lonely, I'm not good enough, I can't do it, I'm alone, I, I, you're still saying I. And this is coming from somebody that I can say, hey, I understand that if you're going through depression. Part of my test, I was in a psych ward for a week. I was so depressed I wanted to take my life. I'm glad that my life is not in my hands but in his. I'm glad that I don't have to face that darkness anymore because I've been brought anew in life and light. Yet my mind still remains in this sin-fallen world. Oh, that's adorable. I had a hair from my wife on my head. It just made me think of her. Um, little reminders, right? You don't have to be caught in that trap of thinking like that. You have to force yourself to think about something good. That's the harder thing to do. It is easier to think about sinful things. It's easier to think about painful things. It is hardest when you are amidst the painful thing to force yourself to think about something good. But he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our action. He is absolutely worthy of our thoughts because it's not for him to be blessed by our thoughts. He's trying to tell us as his kids, it's a blessing for you. That's where you're going to get your peace. That's where you're going to get, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Even, even though I'm walking through this, it is well with my soul. Charles Spurgeon is quoted in saying, I'm not going to quote it perfectly, but I have learned to kiss the waves that crash me into the rock of ages. These trials and these pains and these thoughts May they not drive you further from him, but drive you closer into him. We have to take captive our thoughts. I was cleaning out the garage yesterday, and there's a lot of stuff in that garage that I do not need. I got this rule in my head, and though I've never applied it, um, that if I open a box and I look, and it's something that I haven't used since the moment I moved in, I'm just going to throw it away. But then when I start to throw it away, Beth says, what's in the box? Do 
said, there we go. You know, like kids' teeth and stuff. She keeps weird things. I don't know. <laughs> when you travel into your own thoughts, there are some things that you need to just keep in the box and ship it out and throw it away. All of those things that the world will say about you, all of your past, all of your present, all of your future that is unknown, that will cause you to stress and cause you to be unrestful, to cause you to be discontent. Fold that away and give it to God. Get it out of your mind. It's not beneficial for you. It isn't. The scriptures say, with stressing, being anxious, can you add one more minute to your life? If anything, it it removes from your life, from your joy, to stress about these things. Removes those moments of joy that you could have to focus on what is good. We'd rather not focus on anything else. Got to throw, throw that stuff away. Put away all forms of envy, discontentment, malice, wrath, slander, anger. Put it all away. Because all of that in your past, in your present, and for your future, when you stumble again and you happen to open up another box and say, oh yeah, I forgot about that. That was all put on his shoulders. We serve a king of action that matches perfectly with his words, his thoughts, his will. On that cross with the thieves on either side of him, And one of them says, remember me, remember me, please, when you enter your kingdom. Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. Not only did he say it with his word, today you will be with me in paradise. He then later gave up his life and sealed the deal with his actions, met his words. Far often than not, our actions do not meet up with our words. To our, to our shame, that's the opposite. Our actions, when they don't meet up with obedience, brings about shame. And I've been in those spirals before where if I, if I give a centimeter to a sin, the first thought that pops in is, well, I've already messed up, I've already sinned, I might as well see this thing all the way through. Stupidity. That moment is when you need to put that thing in the box. As soon as you think about it, as soon as it pops in your head. There have been times when, and I've learned my lesson not to speak out against the devil or speak out against any heavenly host or anything like that. But early in my walk, my kids would tell my wife, mom, dad's yelling at the devil again because I'd be caught up in a thought that I shouldn't be thinking about. And I would want to say, devil, get out of here. I don't want that anymore. I don't want it. These stinking limbs do. I don't. Be far from me. It's not beneficial. The simplicity of obedience is putting that stuff away because in Hebrews we read that God says, I will remember your sin no more. Why do you keep opening up the box? He chooses to not remember it. It's not that he's like, oh yeah, I forgot that he did that. He knows exactly what you've done, what you will do, beside all that, despite of all that, he sent his son to save you. What you thinking about? Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. Well, this is Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 through 3. Paul again writing. And we can all agree that Paul has been through some stuff. He had been left for dead outside of towns and cities for preaching the good news of the gospel. And then when he was raised to health through time and healing and doctors and Luke, got up, walked right back into the city that just tried to kill him. Why? Actions speak louder than words. And he knew why he was going back in. He, know, he knows who he loves. Romans 12, 1 through 3. I appeal to you, he's writing to the church, capital C. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You are to be a live sacrifice, a living sacrifice, because he already died your death. You will not taste death eternal, the second death. 
You are to be as you go, rejoicing in the joy you have because you have a Savior and a King who loves you dearly. You live in His life. Walk as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He has told us everything that we need to know. As I taught the Digging Deeper Teen Bible Study at Roush World this last week, I told them, he is teaching us and telling us everything that we need to know to live a life of godliness. Not everything we want to know. There's a difference. He will tell you everything you need. This is God's word breathed out and it's profitable for all the things that you need to know in order to renew your mind. Because your mind in sin is dead. Your mind in Christ is alive. You're going to have to learn how to think differently. You're going to have to learn how to walk differently. And he will give you all of these things. Go to him in prayer and ask. If any of you lacks wisdom, search for it on Google. No, 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 no. Ask God for it. The giver of that blessing. And even him giving you wisdom, does that bless him? No. It is for your benefit. He's a father in heaven. You are his children. Will not a good father give good gifts on this earth? How much more than the heavenly father give you in the Holy Spirit? Romans 12 continues on in verse 3. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Do not think too highly of yourself. And what does the world say? You're number one. It's all about you. Burger King, have it your way. The customer is always right. I work, I, <laughs> let me tell you something. I've worked in retail. That is, I don't know where they came up with that. The customer is not always right. But we live in a world where we are told that we are number one. We are not, the scriptures tell us, we are not to think more highly than ourselves. I would encourage us to stop beating yourself up so much on the opposite end of that scale. Christ died for you, took your place, loved you with his whole life, death, burial, resurrection, so that you would have relationship to a father who loves you and wants you to be blessed. And that choice over here is yours whether to obey him or not. Why do we not? It is easier to obey him in action. It's easier to walk up to somebody on the side corner when they have a sign that says, need money and need help. And you walk up and you say, hey, here's a 20. All right. Everybody, I'm giving him a 20 fantastic. Probably going to buy beer with it. Uh-oh. You can, you can have all the actions you want. How's your thought life? What's your intention? What's your heart in doing that? Because if any of this is about you, you are deceived. If all of this is about you, you are deceived. This whole week, dang it, Tim, this whole week, that's all I could think about was myself. How many phone calls of encouragement could I put out there? How many times spent with any of you could I sat down and prayed with you and talked about the things of God? But all I could think about was what I was going through. Oh, I get frustrated with myself. <sighs> but I know my father's not frustrated with me. I know there's something for me to learn. I'm just, I'm, just wait, I'm just waiting for that day where he just, <laughs> he did a good job bringing in the wood. Translate that over to, well done, good and faithful servant. Because Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. <laughs> for those who are called according to his purpose. 
It's not going to feel like the things that you are going through right now are working together for good. Since he is working all things out for his good, for the good of those who love him, you realize the world is actively working against you? The world is acting to deceive you, to push you down, to have your eyes drawn only unto yourself, for your cares, for your concerns, and that is the opposite of rest. The world wants you restless, discontent. I'm so tired of advertisements all the time. But they want you discontent, they want you restless, and they want your mind going in a thousand different directions. Do you know what the average human adult attention span is now? I have no idea. I didn't watch the video long enough to get the rest of the... Um, it's because... They want to keep, the world wants to keep your mind on a thousand things. We may be busy in action, we're busier up here. Flip side, the right side, God's blessing for us in true blessedness is our rest and our contentment and knowing that he's provided everything that we could ever ask for or need. And he provided for it before we even asked him for it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind in knowing that, oh, this is rough right now. Right now. How quick is right now over? It already is. Eternity, where no tear shed, no pain, no sorrow, just grace, love, utter peace, joy everlasting, some of y'all I know don't sing now because you don't believe you have a good enough singing voice. You'll be singing then. I can promise you that. <sighs> Why don't we dwell on that more? Was when, for when we dwell on him more, these trials are simply that. Something that will pass. When we dwell on him. We dwell on eternal things. And there's a, there's a peace just that, a peace which surpasses all understanding that you are held in the sovereign hands of God. And we're going to learn some things on this earth that are hard and difficult lessons. But in that learning, it works out for a true, blessed for his children. I mentioned my kids this last week. They're starting to train them to do the harder jobs on the lawn and the weed whacker. Uh, made mama nervous with Camden out there just swinging a weed whacker back and forth. <sighs> And I told them, guys, I could do all of this myself. I could. I could get this whole lawn done probably quicker. But that wouldn't benefit me at all. And I know it wouldn't benefit you. So you're going to learn how to do this. The blessedness in this passage in Luke, true blessedness, is because the Father wants what's best for you. You're going to have to learn to be content. You're going to have to learn to be patient. No, we don't like that. You're going to have to learn these things. This is a picture of a hole that comes out from a broken part of a Roman prison. That's, uh, uh, I got some scripture on it. I thought it was a fantastic visual that through this broken hole, through this Roman prison, um, I thought a lot about Paul, I thought about a lot of Peter, I thought about a lot of the martyrs that died in the prisons, the, the, the church, early church reformers, so on and so forth. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, Colossians 3, 2. You could focus on that whole entire prison, that whole entire circumstances. I would suggest that you just focus on the light. You focus on the light, you know that through the light that there's a sun. You know that there's son because there's a creator and that creator he created all things good but because of the sin of man these things fall into sin but he did not leave us here in our sin he had a plan to redeem the cosmos oh that for a little while the darkness seems overwhelming focus on the light focus on his peace set your mind on things above there is nothing better to think about there is no one better to talk about. 
Do not let your mind be consumed by your thoughts. And know who you are seeking. Know who you are coming to talk to. That God is holy and perfect and righteous. And the blessings that he's poured out on us are not for his benefit. There are so many things in this world that the devil can use to come and try to steal your joy. To try to make you think about. A lot of times he doesn't have to make you. You're thinking about it already. But know who you serve. Know who you obey. So that when you go out and you state, I'm doing this for the Lord, and you do the thing for the Lord, you know you have that intention that it's out of gratitude from saving faith from Christ Jesus that that's why you're doing it. And you're thinking of yourself less. Know who you're searching for. Because if you don't know, you don't know what you're looking for, you will only find the things you don't need. If you're scrambling around and you're trying to find things to fill the void, even in your thought life, it's just going to keep you right where the enemy wants you, distracted. I was humbled by my wife. Husband's in here, if I could get an amen. Uh, I was humbled by my wife when she saw that this week was really difficult for me. And I was finding all sorts of stuff to do. Well, I really need to clean the basement. Why well, do you need to clean that garage? Why well, should get this done? I need to get this done. And I just couldn't sit still. And so she came and talked to me. It's like, are you like doing these things because you're not wanting to address what's going on in here and here? Keeping yourself busy, keeping yourself distracted so you don't have to sit in the reality of what actually is going on. And I said, no. Yes, yes, okay, fine, yes. The devil's trying to do the same thing to you. Keep you distracted. Keep you pulled in all these directions. Keep you every single which way, but in his word, in prayer, in rest. True blessedness is knowing who you serve, why you serve him. Out of love, out of gratitude, out of peace that you will have for eternity in his son. That is why every morning on this morning, <laughs> on Sundays, I say grace and peace because that's my wish and my hope for you and that's my wish and my hope for myself. But that'll come by dwelling on what we have in him. Know who you're looking for. He is right there. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Forgive me for, forgive me for me. Letting the enemy come and steal my joy. I pray this prayer for anybody out here today that is going through something that they are learning. That they may have peace, contentment. That they may, may let out that deep sigh of letting go. Trusting in your hands as we walk through this thing called life. Knowing that you will see us through for eternity. You are good. Your way is true. Your word is righteous, pure, and holy. And you have called us a people unto yourself through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ that not by our works we shall boast, but through the saving gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We, we get to have all of you. You are all accessible at any time we can pray to you, any time we can think about you, any time we can come to your word. Help us dwell in what we ought. May you protect us from the evil schemes of the devil. May you protect us even so from our own thoughts. I ask that you stoke up the Holy Spirit in our minds that when something, when something creeps in or when we think about something we ought not to, that you bring an awareness to our mind and our heart that we ought to, that we must take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to your Son. That is where our rest is. 
that is where our contentment is. That is how we be still, even during the most violent of storms. Trusting in you. We love you and we praise you and help us. Help us match our actions to our words, even more so. Help it match the intentions of our heart. We want to glorify you. We need you to do so. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name, amen. As the worship team comes up, I'll close with 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 7. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. We destroy arguments. Sometimes we bring up arguments to ourselves. Sometimes the enemy brings up arguments and his own lofty opinions. Did God really say dot, dot, dot? But when you put them up against the knowledge of God, every man's opinion, every scheme of the devil falls. So trust in his word. Trust in thinking on what we ought. God is good. Let's sing, trust, and obey.
My hope is that it is a true blessedness for you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your time, with all your thoughts, with all of you, because he gave all of himself so that we would have eternal life with our Heavenly Father. So, grace and peace, you are dismissed to fellowship.